everyone. Welcome to Goodbye Greenwashing, our three-part edu series on the natural cosmetic movement, natural ingredients, and third-party certifications. I'm Audrey Wesson. Today, in part one, we will explore the background of the wellness movement, the push for transparency in natural cosmetics, and the importance of third-party certifications for natural cosmetics. In part two, we will dive into one specific certification method, the USDA BioPreferred program. And in part three, we will look towards intellect's ingredients for formulating high performance natural cosmetics. This is part one. I'm sure you all have been hearing about the natural products movement, which has been a major shift in personal care in the past decade and even before that. Today, we are going to demystify this projected $22 billion industry and look at why it started, how it will continue to transform, and how you can appeal to your ever-changing consumers who are asking for more natural beauty products. One of the drivers behind the naturals movement in cosmetics is the desire to be well, feel well, and live well. The wellness economy is a $3.7 trillion industry, of which beauty and anti-aging are a part. Wellness and natural cosmetics have always been inherently linked for hundreds of years, from traditional Chinese medicine to Ayurvedic remedies. Humans have used natural sources in their beauty products and personal care. One of the ways that wellness has manifested in beauty is through this concept of self-care. It's really a buzzword today on social media, on different media platforms. Even the New York Times writes an article that says, if face masks are involved, it's probably self-care. This element of mental health and relaxation is really more widespread among today's millennials. People are encouraging themselves and each other to take time for mental health, and they're using their face masks and their skin routine in order to achieve this. Consumers not only want beauty products that make them look and feel better, but they also now expect and demand that the companies they buy from are socially and environmentally conscious. Companies can communicate that they are socially and environmentally conscious through a variety of aspects. Lately, we see claims such as sustainable, clean, natural. But how do you communicate that in a way that resonates with your customers and builds consumer trust in what you're telling them about your products? Today, we are going to talk about some ways that you can more accurately and directly communicate these highly desired claims like natural and clean. In the food industry, we have seen a rise in plant-based diets and even veganism. Consumers may be drawn to plant-based diets for a variety of reasons, including but not limited to environmental impact and animal welfare which has created an association with plant-based materials being healthier for humans, animals, and planet. For years, we have been looking to certifications by third-party organizations in order to validate the claims that a beauty brand is looking to make. Natural certifications specifically gained popularity at the turn of the century because of the prominence of greenwashing. TerraChoice conducted a study in 2010 where they witnessed 95% of greener products committing at least one of the seven sins of greenwashing. This greenwashing effect diluted the natural products in the market and caused consumer distrust with brands that were truly natural and green. Hence the introduction of more natural certifications. The process of going through a third-party certification validates the naturalness of a product and builds more consumer trust with that product that's claiming to be natural. Now that we've talked a little bit about the importance of third-party certifications, we're going to start to look at some specific certifying bodies and different standards that are used to determine naturality. Before we get into the weeds, I just wanted to go back a little bit and talk about some of the historical aspects. I'm going to take it back to the early 60s. We had things like uh, Rachel Carson with the Silent Spring that gave rise to chemophobia. And actually, things like rivers were catching on fire. There was something called the Cuyahoga River that actually caught fire. Yes, caught, physically caught fire. 
So if that's something, if that doesn't make you open your eyes, I don't know what does. So essentially, uh, that was the genesis of it. We went into the 70s, and people started to really notice and become cognizant of the encroachment of chemistry on the food supply. A lot of things that drove our move lately is what happened back in the late 60s and 70s with food. And an example of that is uh, I remember Mr. Softy would come by, and in the summertime, I bought a Mr. Softy cone and unfortunately dropped it in the middle of the summer on the sidewalk. Came back the next day, and unfortunately, the cone had not melted, and the ants didn't even like it. So obviously, something is awry. So looking at things like moving away from preservation and looking towards more natural ingredients to help maintain a food supply that's more consistent with the way we feel about our food. So this awareness about naturality as it relates to our food extended to other aspects of our lives and eventually got to cosmetics. Not only are we starting to think about effects in terms of the environment, but also effects in terms of the materials action on our body. Starting in the early 80s, people or cosmetic companies and marketers really started looking to add some natural flavor to the marketing story. So they began doing things like taking a standard formulation, say hair care, and adding some extracts to it, and then plastering all over the label. For example, we would take a standard hair conditioner, add some grapefruit extract, and then plaster all over the label that the material is essentially made from grapefruit. And this is one example of what Audrey was talking about in terms of greenwashing. So a lot of that went on. It took some time before consumers became aware of what was going on in that regard and became more sophisticated in terms of wanting to understand what's in their products that they're applying to their body. They wanted to look beyond the practice of greenwashing and try to understand how perhaps there's something they could do to understand more about what they were buying. So this gave rise to third-party organizations, basically non-governmental organizations, popping up to actually look at the makeup of the cosmetic ingredient and perhaps even apply some form of certification to that ingredient to give consumers more confident that they weren't suffering from greenwashing. So some of the organizations that started to pop up even though they might have been created for other things, such as certification of food and such, they began popping up and looking at potential ways that they could assist the industry and the consumer being able to identify which products are not greenwashed products. And some of these organizations are we have out of France, EcoCert. Out of the UK, we have the Soil Association. The first organization that actually specifically targeted cosmetics was Cosmobio, another one out of France. And then we also have ICEA out of Italy and out of Germany, BDIH. These organizations cropped up and began to try to transfer some of the certification approaches that they were using for other applications such as food for the cosmetic industry. So they started creating these things called standards. And the standards are essentially documents that put together requirements, summarizing the aspects of a particular product, finished cosmetic product, and that, of course, translates back to the ingredients that relate to what we're going to call the naturality of the product. And at that point, the standards were different. So, for instance, Intellex as an ingredient supplier may want to obtain certification from all of these certification organizations, but since the certifications were different, perhaps in one, we wouldn't satisfy all of the requirements, but in the other, we could. And that became a problem for many ingredient suppliers and even cosmetic marketers. So there was a demand for perhaps some sort of agreement between these groups. And in 2010, they actually unified and created something called the Cosmos Standard. 
And since that point, each of the individual certification bodies, although handling administrative aspects of the certification independently, all use the same standards to rate the naturality of the individual ingredient and or finished cosmetic product. We'll talk a little bit about the Cosmos standard. First of all, it's a very comprehensive document. It's actually 47 pages, and it outlines requirements not only concerning the ingredient itself, where it comes from, but also toxicological aspects of it, and also aspects of how it's made and how those manufacturing techniques may impact the environment. Some of the key points are the source of the matter used to produce either the ingredient or the finished product. Uh, that would be mainly focused on plant-based materials and maybe some other aspects of them, such as whether the plant-based material was derived from seed that's actually genetically modified. We call that GMO, genetically modified organisms. And when we talk about GMO, we're really talking about the plant itself being of its DNA, if you will, of genetic modification or modifications occurred through manipulation by humans. Another aspect is in many cases to produce a different chemical structure from an original structure or the fundamental structure provided by the plant material, we have to use something called chemical modification. Well, that can occur through chemical synthesis, chemical processes that are used by chemists and engineers around the world, but also through biotransformations. A lot has gone on more recently in creating new biological species, if you will, such as bacteria that are the result of genetic modification. For instance, we may take a fragment of DNA from a bacteria and put that into a fragment uh, from a different bacteria, even a plant organism. We call this transgenic modification and create a new organism that would not possibly be created by nature. Then if we use that organism to do that bio transformation, there are some concerns in terms of both what are we creating, are we creating something that wouldn't occur through nature, and also what could potentially happen if that genetically modified microorganism was not contained. So in addition to GMO, GMM is also something that the COSMO standard focuses quite a bit on. One thing that the COSMO standard does allow, though, when using GMM, is the use of the genetically modified microorganism to create the enzyme. Now, it's the enzyme that comes from the organism that actually does the work for you. And what they say is if that enzyme could be created outside of where the biotransformation is to occur, that is allowed. It can be isolated. One of the key elements of the COSMO standard is the practice of utilizing green chemistry principles. Not only does COSMOS allow only certain chemical process in the creation of chemically modified materials, they strongly emphasize that you use as many of what we call the principles of green chemistry as much as possible. And here we'll quickly review some of the principles. Number one, we have pollution prevention. Uh, some examples of that are not of course, dumping any chemical byproducts into streams, uh, allowing materials to escape from the process vessels into the air. We want to do as much as we possible in terms of preventing any chemical species from exiting the space where the material is being produced. Number two is atom economy. That one sounds pretty exotic, but in fact, it's very simple. That's essentially the amount of stuff that you get out relative to the amount of the stuff you put in to the synthesis. So say if I take A and I take one part of A and I get 0.9 parts of B out, that in terms of atoms would be an atom economy of 90%. So you want to use a process that conserves as many of the atoms in the original starting material 
as you translate that down to the final product. Three, less hazardous chemical synthesis, synthetic organic chemist, which I happen to be, know that many times there's different pathways to get from point A to point B. And in certain instances, maybe there are two pathways, pathways one and two to get from point A to point B. And perhaps pathway one would be maybe essentially very economical, if you will, from a dollars and cents point of view, but also may pose greater hazards to the workers who actually have to perform the process. So we may choose something that may be a little bit less economical, a pathway two, to provide a pathway to get from A to B that's less hazardous to the workers who are actually performing the synthesis. Number four, designing safer chemicals. Clearly, we want to provide a material that does what it's supposed to do, but we want the material to minimize potential adverse effects to both the body and to the environment. Number five, safer solvents and auxiliaries. Solvents, in many cases, tend to be more hazardous materials. They tend to be volatile, but they're essential in many cases in chemical synthesis. However, with excellent use of technology, you may form a pathway that allows you to make that chemical transformation without using the solvent. However, if you're stuck with the solvent, maybe instead of using a petrochemical solvent that has some negative safety characteristics, you find something that's greener in terms of the amount of CO2, for example, that is emanated when it's produced. Number six, design for energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is important. It's good, sound chemical engineering principles. You don't want to waste energy. So I think this would be an obvious inclusion into the 12 principles of green chemistry. We don't really want to design for energy inefficiency. Seven, using renewable feedstocks. That is using something where we define a renewable. That would be either plant-based or animal-based feedstocks and essentially steering away from non-renewable feedstocks, which essentially means petrochemical feedstocks. So use plant-based feedstocks. Eight, reducing derivatives. Many cases to go from point A to the final product, point B. You may have to go through various steps using a particular approach. And if you can cut out some of those steps, typically called making intermediate compounds or derivatives, you're moving towards a greener process. Number nine, use of catalysts. Sometimes many individuals are concerned by catalysis because it sounds scientific, if you will, but catalysts are really good. What a catalyst is is something that you can use that reduces the energy required for a reaction. So obviously that ties into principle number six. Using a catalyst, say, may allow you to perform a reaction at significantly lower temperature, and therefore you're saving the energy required to go to that higher temperature. Number 10, design for degradation. Back in the olden days, in my day, you would not necessarily think about this. Really, you wanted materials to last forever, but now we've learned through various experiences, most recently being the one concerning microplastics, that you may not want the material to last forever, and you want it to degrade. Biodegradation is a very important aspect of the principles of green chemistry. And we're designing the material. We know what type of moieties within the structure tend to be susceptible to attack by microorganisms. So by design, we build those moieties into the molecule to make it more susceptible to degradation down the road. Number 11 is real-time analysis for pollution prevention. And basically what this means is, in many cases, you have to follow the course of a reaction to determine how far along it is when you're monitoring the production. And this involves taking samples, taking them to the laboratory and performing destructive analysis. That means when you perform the analysis, you actually destroy the material. And what's coming along quite nicely, especially since the 80s, 90s, and now into this century is something called real-time analysis, where you can actually use modern technology. For example, a probe that tells you the analytical profile of the material during the course of the reaction in real time. 
So you save the use of the laboratory reagents and you also save some yield because you're not taking material out of the reaction space. And lastly, we have inherently safer chemistry for accident prevention. Again, that's more in line with number four. If you have a choice of a certain approach, you want to design into the chemistry, which in turn transfers to the chemical engineering pathways that lead to unit operations that are safer from an operator perspective or for a local community perspective. In summary, all of these principles of green chemistry are good for humans, good for the environment, and also allow us to stick with the tenets that are outlined in the COSMOS standard. The COSMOS standard actually has a section on green chemistry and what us as a company doing chemical transformations will do is outline the various aspects of our process to show Cosmos the certifier that we are very aware of these principles and we're doing the best we can in our product design and our offerings to the marketplace to be consistent with these principles. Another certification coming out of Germany is Natru. And this is a certification that is independent of the Cosmos standard. So they have their own standard. They're founded in 2007. Many of our products appear in Natru Certified Cosmetics. And with Natru, essentially, our customers supply cosmetic information to Natru and they will certify it. Although Natru does maintain an annex that lists, quote, approved, unquote, ingredients. One thing that's interesting about the Nature standard, they give a little bit more preference to materials that we call nature identical. That means a chemical compound that was produced using synthetic techniques by humans that has an identical chemical structure is that which is found through production by a plant, for instance. Another certification coming out of the United States is one that's administered by NSF, and surprisingly, that's not the National Science Foundation. It's the National Sanitation Foundation. And they've developed a standard, what we call NSF, ANSI 305. And you can read the standard, and there are many similar aspects to the standard of Cosmos and Nature, for example. They really don't certify ingredients. They certify finished materials. And it's another standard that many of Intellect's products conform to. The NSF ANSI 305 standard is the only American standard that allows labeling and marketing for, quote, contains organic ingredients, unquote, personal care products. Another standard that was published about five years ago is something called ISO 16128. Now, there's no such thing as certification or no companies that are administering the standard. It's essentially a standard that stands on its own. And the industry can use the techniques within the standard to determine the acceptable naturality of their material. Now, they have the definition for derived natural. And from that, that must be greater than or equal 50% natural. And the way that's calculated is if you look in the upper right corner, we have a, something called isopropyl palmitate, and that's derived from something called palmitic acid and isopropyl al alcohol in a esterification reaction. Now, the isopropyl alcohol is fully from petrochemical sources, whereas the palmitic acid comes from natural sources. So what you can do is the circle part of the diagram gives you the atoms that are coming from the natural source, and you take the sum of the molecular weight of those atoms and you divide that by the total molecular weight of the substance. You multiply that 100, that gives you a percentage. And in that instance, in the example, we're talking about 80.4%. So for derived natural under ISO 16128, that would be considered derived natural. They also have some tenets in there for allowed processes, allowed solvents. And that's essentially it for ISO 16128. One thing interesting from a chemist perspective, although we've had all these certifications, normally chemists or scientists like to have proof. The mere fact that 
a material is certified, well, they may not be telling the truth. So we've developed, or these methods that have been developed over the course of time that allow you to actually determine analytically, using a chemical analytical method, the content of the carbon in the sample that is derived from non-petrochemical sources. And the most popular one is ASTM D6866. And what that does is essentially you've got natural carbon has the isotope C14 over time that degrades. So young carbon has a certain level of carbon-14, and over time that goes to C12. So old, old carbon, which you may see from a dinosaur who was killed millions of years ago and have been in the earth, that would have a very low content of carbon-14. So petrochemicals, low carbon-14 content. So you can analyze a sample and get an undisputed measurement of the percentage of the carbon that is from plant source. The USDA BioPreferred program was developed in the 90s in order to promote the use of agricultural products and byproducts that were grown on American soil. One of the key elements of the BioPreferred program is that in order to prove that a material is indeed an agricultural-based product, use of the ASTM method acts as a key point of differentiation between the USD BioPreferred program and the other certification programs previously outlined. As opposed to subjective measures, this program is the solution for a quantitative measurement of naturality and allows brands to be the most transparent regarding how natural their products are. Getting your products certified by third-party organizations is a great way to communicate to your customer that the formulation is natural. As we know, the natural movement in cosmetics is not going away anytime soon, and differentiating your brand from the offenders of greenwashing is becoming increasingly crucial. The USDA BioPreferred program is one great way to accomplish this. In part two of the Edu series, we will host Kate Lewis from the United States Department of Agriculture to discuss the benefits of this program and the process for getting your products certified bio-based through the USDA BioPreferred program. We hope you've enjoyed part one and please join us again next time for part two of Goodbye Greenwashing.